mountains of Afghanistan, a Canadian sniper will eclipse Reichert's one-mile kill shot, taking out a Taliban fighter one and a half miles away. I don't know if they just thought that today was their lucky day, but who was it? The Macmillan TAC-50 Long Range Sniper Rifle. A 50 caliber round leaves the muzzle at 2,700 feet per second. A combination of power and accuracy, the TAC-50 is capable of taking out a vehicle 20 football fields away. The very first time I fired the TAC-50 was an awakening to know that there's something out there with that much power. How would I describe it? an enemy's worst nightmare. The sniper, Rod Furlong, longest kill shot in history, one and a half miles. March 2002, U.S. forces launch Operation Anaconda. The mission, destroy Al-Qaeda and Taliban forces in the shah e Valley. The terrain is rugged and unforgiving, the mountains filled with enemy fighters. Furlong is part of a Canadian sniper team attached to U.S. Special Forces. It's pretty humbling coming into somebody's home turf, pushing into that valley that day. I'm almost in awe. We're moving into a fishbowl, and we could see all these Taliban fighters. They're up on the higher ground. I had no experience in operating in those kind of altitudes. Furlong's weapon, the Macmillan TAC-50, a sniper rifle with a max effective range of 2,190 yards. The very first target we engaged was 1,500 meters. That was the closest target we would engage during Operation Anaconda. We want to be close enough to target that we can guarantee one shot, one kill. But when you're shooting at a human-sized target at 1,500 meters, there's so many variables to take into place. Furlong works at elevations as high as 10,000 feet. The extreme altitude has a dramatic effect on long-range shots. Every 1,000 feet you go up, it's a whole new set of equations. Because the air's getting thinner. So therefore, your muzzle velocities are, are increasing. Your time of flight is actually shorter from the distance further down. It's played a huge factor What our uh hit ratio, not a lot of one-round hits. Reason being is we're dealing with, at times, I remember, at least three crosswinds. And you just you wait for that perfect moment. It's great if I can get the winds to die out, but how many times does three crosswinds die out? They don't. We were so effective. We'd shut down all resupply lines, and the guys who would try to use them would actually get down on their faces and crawl. Within a week, Furlong runs out of his Canadian-made ammo. We had somebody offer us uh, American-made ammunition. And when we started using it, we noticed that it was a hotter round. We're getting a lot longer distances out of this round. You know, whether that round was uh, a lighter round, whether it was a faster-burning propellant, I, I don't know. Every shot that we made was new for us. Whether the U.S. rounds are more aerodynamic or simply have a faster burning propellant, the results are dramatic. Furlong and his team take out enemy targets more than a mile away, but his longest shot is yet to come. The shah e Valley, mean altitude 9,000 feet. When somebody's walking on, on a river valley floor, I'm up at 8,500 feet. I'm looking down. It's almost like being on the clouds, looking at someone. We had observed a three-man Taliban team, and one of them had an RPK, which is 7.62 machine gun on the shoulder. And it was decided that we would engage the Taliban fighter with the, the RPK in the, on the shoulder. My partner lases the target, gives me the distance, he starts to give me bearing, wind direction. It's everything I'm using to enter in data into my scope, or in this case, what am I going to do to be able to reach that range? You're talking about a mile and a half distance. 
and they're looking for a man-sized target on the side of a mountain. Now, that in itself is, is quite a feat to actually find that guy in the first place. Furlong looks for any way to get more distance on his shot. He resorts to an old sniper trick. It was a very warm day. We had our ammo laid out in the sun. Anything to increase range. It's not going to make a huge difference, but it will make a little difference for how propellant acts, a faster burn, allowing the round to travel slightly further. Because of the extreme angle and the distance, Furlong uses the ambush method, leading the target or allowing it to walk into the path of the bullet. I max out my elevation drum. My windage is maxed out. So I'm halving up my scope. And what I mean by that is I'm leading with my mill dots, but I'm also using my mill dots for elevation as well. So I'm kind of halving my scope to where I believe my point of aim is. When you have a scope, uh, usually this is what everybody's thinking about for a point of aim. If I'm leading a target uh, and I have a target walking from right to left, he's walking and I'm waiting for him to hit this point right here. Once that target is at my point of aim, that's when the shot's released. That's an ambush. You're not releasing on the crosshairs. You release, this is what you're using for a point of aim, and that's one mil. Basically, with a four mil lead and a four mil for elevation, your point of aim roughly would be in this area. Furlong aims four mils, or roughly 15 feet above, and approximately four mils, or 15 feet to the left of his target. These holds compensate for bullet drop, wind, and spin drift. Furlong steadies himself, takes aim, and fires. And for my partner, it's miss. Whatever reason, when dealing with the Taliban, they didn't show a lot of fear. You would shoot at them sometimes, and uh, they wouldn't even move. And they knew they were being shot at. Like, the splash would hit by their feet or an object next to them. And I don't know if they just thought that Today was our lucky day, but it wasn't. Furlong's spotter follows the vapor trail, or swirl of the bullet on his first shot, then observes the splash, or dirt kicked up by the round as it hits the ground. To quantify that, if you can imagine, the observer watched a 50 caliber bullet at a mile and a half away impact the ground, and then he called adjustments from where the bullet landed to where he knew the bullet had to be to hit the enemy. Burlong sets up for his second shot. They go three different directions, not too far, roughly 20 to 30 feet where they scatter, but I can see him. Furlong fires his second shot. He misses, hitting the Taliban soldier's backpack. Between the second and third, there was no correction needed. I knew exactly what had to happen, and I wanted to get that third shot down range. One and a half miles separate Furlong and his target. He fires. Furlong's round leaves the rifle at 2,700 feet per second. Time of flight, four seconds. Target eliminated. I know he went down, but that's about it. If a 50 cal round hits you, you're not gonna live to tell about it. It's a devastating round. When you're talking about a projectile going through you, that's roughly the, a little bit larger than your thumb. Rob Furlong's mile and a half kill shot shatters Carlos Hathcock's previous record by 157 yards. I knew who Carlos Hathcock was, but didn't know what the distance was. I don't know if it really has hit me. I, I always just took it as a, I was just doing my job. Rob Furlong's record still stands today, but high in the mountains of Arizona, an ex-Navy SEAL tries to duplicate his shot from a mile and a 